Hi everybody. Um, yeah, Problogging, Money Metrics and Mentalism. I first probably better explain the mentalism bit. Uh, I run a pro blog called Mobile Mentalism. And then I've got others called Media Mentalism and Finder Mentalism, so you can see where the pattern's coming from there. And I like the alliteration of the money metrics and mentalism, so that's where that came from. Uh, what I'm basically going to discuss today, what I did a few years ago, I saw that blogs were coming into prominence. My background has always been with web technologies. Suddenly I started reading these little interesting pieces about how Clifford was actually earning money using ProBox. I'll explain what ProBox is in a sec. Um, and I thought to myself, well, they're obviously earning money because so many more reports are coming out and they seem to be earning quite a fair bit of money. And I thought, but I looked at the blogs that were earning money and I thought, but well, I could do that. And then I thought, well, actually, why don't I do that? And so I started doing that a couple of years ago. Um, so what I'm basically going to do today uh, is basically take you through uh, the last couple of years uh, of the experiences that I've had uh, in developing a pro blog and how to actually earn money doing it. I'm going to set it in the context of Web 2.0 because it does fit quite nicely with those technologies. Um, so the overview of today's presentation, very brief talk about Web 1.0, the original web if you like, how that changed with Web 2.0 and what Web 2.0 brings that's different uh, to the whole web environment that makes things like pro blogging such a viable proposition in terms of uh, earning money. Uh, I'll then spend the rest of the time focusing on the pro blog and show you some of the things that have happened to me and to my blogs over the past couple of years. If at any point you want to ask questions, obviously feel free to do so, but I must warn you, apparently I have too many slides, so I might be like going through some of them uh, very fast at some point. <laughs> so just be aware, if you ask questions, it will slow things down even more, and Steve won't be happy. So um, starting off anyway with the uh, Web 1.0, as I call it, the original web. Um, obviously, as, as we all know, it was invented by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989, so he's coming up to his 20th birthday now. Uh, his original vision uh, was the dream behind the web is a common information space in which we communicate by sharing information. Obviously at the time, because nobody else had actually any experience of anything like this, certainly not from a worldwide scale, it was simply a case of people just throwing up individual web pages, the HTML at the time was very simple to use, and it was the links that people were actually making to, to each web page that kind of made the thing work. So everything was focused on the links, but a lot of the content was very static. So even though Tim might have had this dream of a common information space that was very grand, um, everybody communicating by sharing information, what we actually got was simply brochureware. After a while, when, after you got the original early adopters, a lot of the companies that piled in, uh, it was simply a case of static web pages. People thought, well, we've already got this literature, uh, we've already got catalogs and things like that, and little leaflets advertising our services, let's just turn that into HTML. And so they did, and you got a very static web page. People have been changing this over time slightly. Um, your individuals generally had more interactive web pages, only interactive though in the sense that they'd be updated every now and then. Um, but there was certainly not a lot the actual individual user could do in terms of interacting with the actual web page. You read information on the World Wide Web originally, you couldn't write to it. So there was no rewrite thing going on, just read only. Also, there were a couple of problems with the original web model. Uh, firstly, nobody really understood how it worked. Because nobody had ever been faced with a worldwide information space like this before, and there was no central controlling authority regulating how it actually worked, the web evolved <coughs> in the literal sense of the world. So it was completely poorly understood in terms of the way that the actual underlying dynamics were working, how people were interacting with web pages, how the information was evolving over time, how the links would change over time, what strategies would work from a business sense and what wouldn't. Nobody really knew. So you had all these people with great ideas that would just suddenly say, well, why don't we do this? Okay, let's try it. And lots of people with deep funds could venture capitalists who would give lots of money away and saying, I have no idea if that will work or not, let's give it a go, it could be the next Amazon or whatever. So research as well was also very reactive. Because nobody had actually bothered to look at the web in a research context, Research on the web in terms of how linking patterns were happening, how people were using it, things like that, tended to follow the actual businesses themselves that were going on the web. So research was reacting to what was already happening on the web. There was no proactive research in which people were actually projecting the way the web would be in five years' time, for example, doing research into that and then the business models would follow along. The business models were leading what was happening. So the business models were basically kind of like grouping in the dark. They had no idea how to make any money from the web, they just thought they'd see what they could do anyway. And with people basically prepared to, to fund any kind of business idea at all in the heady days of the dot-com years, um, it wasn't a problem for somebody to say, let's try this, let's try that. And so they did. So it really was pure guesswork that people were operating in. So I've described Web 1.0 economics as insanity. 
Um, because the whole idea was advertising would pay for everything. And advertising at the time was on what's known as a CPM basis, cost per thousand impressions. So in other words, for every 1,000 adverts that you showed on your web page, you'd be paid a certain amount of money. So the whole incentive for any kind of person on a, a website um, as their business model was basically to get as many people onto their website as possible. If you got more and more visitors, then obviously you get more money from the advertising, your share price would go up, you could then sell out very quickly. Uh, the idea being, of course, that some bigger company would take you over and you'd therefore earn a lot of money from that, or you'd cash in some of your share options and again you make some money from that. So all uh, the business models were focused on the traffic. It didn't matter how relevant the advertising was, as long as people actually looked at it. So you had all sorts of weird banner ads, all screaming, look at me, look at me, uh, and there was no actual effort to make those banner ads match with what people reading the website were really interested in. And of course, the VC billions, the venture capitalist billions, led to the dot-com boom. Now, I'm assuming at this stage, you all know what I'm talking about by the dot-com boom. Um, I'm an admissions tutor at Reading, and I've got a number of students, obviously, they're coming on the visit days, and they're all around about 16, 17, some of them approaching 18. And they'll talk about the dot-com boom, and they look at me like I'm mad, and they're like, what was that then? And it's taken me a while to realise that they were like 10 years old, or 9, or even 8 years old in some cases, when it actually peaked. And so, of course, they'd never heard about it. So what I take for granted, because I was working at the time in the computer industry, that everybody's heard of the dot-com boom and bust. No, they haven't. Um, anyway, just to recap, that was what happened uh, during the dot-com boom, um, and obviously the subsequent bust in 2000, when I, about $1.75 trillion was wiped off the value of the NASDAQ uh, tech uh, stocks in, in New York pretty much overnight. So obviously, as we all know, it all came crashing down in a very painful way. And for quite some time after that, trying to say it to, to anybody, you earn money on the web, they would just laugh at you. It really was a case that you couldn't get any kind of business going on the web because you were just seen as a dot-com millionaire wannabe, and therefore it was a failed business model right from the start. There seemed to be no way of earning any money on the web. But then Web 2.0 came along, and things slightly changed. The web itself started to mature. It became patently obvious what business models certainly weren't working, and one or two companies were starting to make uh, business models that actually were working. Now, if you look for the last couple of years, certain large acquisitions have been made in the web space once again. And given the actual amount of money that was uh, washing around on the web <coughs> in the early days, some people started to ask, well, hang on a sec, things are creeping up again. Is there another bubble forming? I mean, some of the re recent acquisitions I've listed here, um, I could add another one to those which obviously happened just a few days ago, when AOL bought out Bebo for $850 million. Um, some of the more notable ones, obviously eBay bought Skype for $2.65 billion a couple of years ago. Um, Microsoft's 1.6% purchase of Facebook values it at $15 billion, um, and Microsoft, still not content with us, uh, are looking to buy Yahoo for $44.6 billion. So again, we have these huge figures that have been ban banded around again, so it seems that there must be some value overall. But, is Web2 bringing .com <coughs> 2.0? I contest, no, because this time, it's different, which obviously is what people used to say last time. But this time it really is. I'm not saying, obviously, that every business model is going to succeed and that every web company will succeed, but if you understand what happens when people actually use a website and how to grow that website and the different dynamics and mechanics that go on underneath, then you can form a coherent business model and you can actually start earning money on the web. The web 2.0 dynamics, the way people interact with sites and the way these sites actually work now and the way the whole web feeds upon itself and effectively transfers uh, information and people from one site to another. That's now well understood, and I'll describe a bit of that shortly. We now have proactive research. We've got a lot of people, they know what the web's all about now. They're able to do research on the web that does extrapolate what will happen in five years' time or so. And so the business models can kind of like align quite nicely with the research, rather than the business models doing the research at the cost of billions. We've also got a nicely defined uh, set of economics uh, that captures the way you can actually get a website to grow and actually generate money from it. Um, generally, uh, I've called it with 2.0 economics, but it comprises long tail economics, which I'll discuss in a sec. Um, we've also got social networks, obviously, which is a brand new way uh, for information to be exchanged in a viral way. Um, and contextual advertising, such as Google's <coughs> AdSense. And contextual advertising for the blogger, such as myself, is where the real money lies. So before I carry on, what is Web 2.0? What's the difference between this great buzzword that everyone's talking about, Web 2.0, and the original web? 
Well, if you look on Wikipedia, which is a classic example of a, a Web 2.0 site, uh, it's a term uh, uh, that's applied to a perceived ongoing transition from a collection of websites, the brochure that I was talking about before, to a full-fledged computing platform. In other words, the web itself is a platform upon which you can start to develop that. Applications such as Google Docs, uh, Google's present, anything Google basically, all the applications are coming out there. Uh, the Zoho, which is the equivalent, in other words, all the applications that we used to have that sat on the PC now exist on the web, in what's been called the cloud. Um, so Web 2.0 services are expected to replace desktop computing applications for many purposes. But that's just part of it. <coughs> Tim O'Reilly kind of came up with a great long rambling definition that you can't really fit into one slide, but nonetheless does capture the key parts of the various disparate Web 2.0 technologies. So he sees it as the network as a platform as well. A lot of people are actually starting to develop applications on the web. Adobe have just released their new Air platform, which basically takes, it turns rich into their applications. It takes things like Flash and makes it uh, much more uh, usable in a web context. Microsoft have released Silverlight, which is a very similar thing. Very, very tiny plugins that you add into a browser, but add so <coughs> much functionality in terms of what you can do that people are now talking about rich interactive, uh, rich internet applications, in which case what you're using on the web through a web browser is exactly the same as what you'd use on the desktop. The network generally is a platform. It delivers software as a continually updated service. In the olden days, when we had CDs and DVDs, um, if you released Microsoft Office, for example, and then you needed an update, you used to have to like, create the software again or add the patch and then ship it out on CD. Um, or else get somebody to download it and ultimately patch their uh, individual desktop application uh, on their PC desktop. Now, if all your application uh, code is running on the server, if you need to update that for whatever reason, the user never knows because it's updated on the server. You can add new features on the server. And so the people actually get those new features straight away just by logging on. So it's a completely different way uh, of actually developing software. Equally, you get much more involvement with your individual users using your software because they're now free to consume the information and remix it in many different ways. Taking things, for example, such as Google Maps uh, and mixing it with eBay's advert listings or Amazon's products, for example. Uh, one classic case uh, is a company that uh, basically sells well, they're an affiliate for eBay. And so if you type in your location and you're looking for a particular car, for example, it will come up with a Google map uh, with a certain radius according to what you specified, and then it will list the exact locations of people who are selling that car that you're looking for within your area. They're taking data from one company, data from another, and mixing the two together. And this is happening more and more with RSS feeds and web services so that people are coming up with new services based on those provided by existing companies. Um, it creates network effects. Network effects is basically when you've got a, a, a network, um, like the telephone, the web, even faxes, anything that's a network basically, becomes more usable and more valuable very, very quickly the more people who start to use it. It's the same with social networks. Facebook is only as popular as it is because it benefited from network effects from early on. Lots of people wanted to use Facebook. The more your friends are on Facebook, the more you'll tend to want to get involved with it. If your friends are on Bebo, for example, then you'll go to Bebo. You won't bother with Facebook. So Facebook becomes more valuable because more people are on there. Uh, whereas Bebo, for example, might become less valuable because all the friends actually start going on Facebook. So the more people are on one network compared to another, the more valuable that network will get. And obviously going beyond the page metaphor of Web 1.0 to deliver rich user experiences. And this is a key point uh, because there we're talking about not just uh, reading web contents, but reading and writing. The web becomes much more interactive. You've got wikis where you can write any of the content yourself. Um, you've got many different sites where you can post your own review, for example. Obviously, blogs let you comment all over the place, so it's not just a case anymore of you writing your opinion. You can get other people to actually say whether they agree with you or not or ask you more questions. So it's a much more interactive way of doing things. You've got Flickr where you can upload any images that you want. YouTube, do the same with your videos. That never used to be the case before. Certainly before the web, but even before, say, 2000, 2001. Uh, it was very much a case of here are the videos you might want to see and somebody else is effectively acting as an editor or a filter filtering the information that you wanted to see before you actually got a chance to see it. Now it's much different. You get the publication happening first and the filtering happening later. So in other words, anybody can upload their information now, whether it's images, text, uh, video, whatever it is, anybody can upload that information and the crowd get to filter it by deciding what they like and what they don't. So we dig, for example, you get to decide which piece of news that's been submitted uh, you want to vote to the top. 
So everybody, if they, did, if they vote one particular uh, story, that rises to the top. If the story was already published, it's only later that it's actually voted up. So again, it's publish and then filter rather than the other way around. Now, in terms of the economics of the way these things are working, uh, we focus very much on what's called the long tail. This was a term uh, described by Chris Anderson uh, in his book, which I've got uh, reference to later on. Uh, and this relates to basically if you take individual products or individual items and you rank them according to the popularity of those items, let's start, talk about books, for example, with Amazon. If you look at the, the range of books that Amazon sells and rank them according to uh, the popular titles, so the most popular one uh, will be there, your best sellers, and then the less popular ones will be further to the other side, and um, what you'll see is a huge tail going off. So you'll start very much with like the strong bestsellers being massive titles, and then very quickly the curve will go like that, and the majority of your other titles are only selling once or twice, maybe even a year. Now traditionally, with your average retailer, your bricks and mortar retailer, they obviously would have to focus on the bestsellers to maximise the profits they were getting. They only had limited shelf space. That constrained their inventory. So if some book was only selling one or two copies a year, as obviously Dr. Fouquet Fennell uh, can relate to with some of his books, um, then, <laughs> then ultimately, Barnes & Noble, for example, or, or, or Waterstones, they're not going to be able to stop that book because it's not worth their while. They would much rather sell a better selling book in their shelf space because they have to maximise uh, the shelf space they've got. On the web, however, uh, any store can stock anything. Amazon, of course, literally stocks virtually every book that's out there. Um, Barnes & Noble will, st will stock 130,000 different books, Amazon it's in the millions. And Amazon doesn't have to care whether those books uh, actually sell or not, because all it's providing is a web page. So what Anderson says is that in an era without the constraints of physical shelf space and other bottlenecks of distribution, narrowly targeted goods and services can be as economically attractive as mainstream fare. And that's the key, the narrowly targeted bit. We're now entering a world of the niche. Niche products, niche books, niche music, niche videos, Anything that may only appeal to one or two people is now suddenly economically viable uh, to provide. So as before, we were living in a world of the hits and the blockbusters. Now, whatever you want, you can find and it's available. So this is what Chris Anderson meant with the curve. Here, for example, uh, this is the curve. Effectively, it's just a power law. Uh, your best sellers uh, are here, and your, your, your biggest best sellers uh, will occur right at the very top of the curve, and now they excel everything. Now, Walmart, for example, uh, which is one of America's biggest sellers of CDs simply because it's such a huge company, still, no matter how big a Walmart is, it still has limited uh, shelf space. So uh, these are tunes. It will only be able to stop music uh, down to here, the first 39,000 best-selling CDs, which is still a lot, obviously, 39,000. Um, but Rhapsody, that's been used in this example, which is an online music store very similar to iTunes, will be able to sell millions of different tunes. And so all of these tunes here, some of which may only be purchased once a year, or maybe twice a year, Rhapsody can still incorporate. Because Rhapsody ultimately is only reliant, because it's a completely digital uh, media, Rap Rhapsody is only reliant on how much storage space its servers have got, which with the price of hard disk these days is, is virtually zero. So Rhapsody can stop all these. And what the long tail says, what people have found out, is that even though only one or two of these particular tunes are being sold, if you aggregate the value in all of that tail, it works out to be as much or more than just the hits. So in other words, your physical retailers can only sell stuff in the tail, uh, in the head rather, your hits, your blockbusters, whereas anybody online can compete just as effectively, or in some instances more effectively, by selling all the way down the tail. <coughs> now, long tail, as I, as I said, simply describes a power law curve. Uh, for those in the know, such as Pareto's 80-20 rule, or, or Zip's law. Um, for example, if you chart the number of sales against products, um, the top 20 of the hits will make up 80% of the sales. That's one of the classic examples that's used, which is why, of course, your big retailers used to just stock, well, still do, just stock um, uh, the hits. If you extend that further down the tail, you've actually got a bigger market than just the hits alone, as all these, what are known as aggregators, have discovered. So some examples of some of the companies that have made use of this. Search keywords, believe it or not. If you're a, a lot of the, the search engines are found, um, you would think after a time there would be a finite number of search terms that would people would start entering into something like Google uh, or Yahoo or any of the search engines. That after a while, all the search terms that people are using would eventually be exhausted and there'd be no other search terms that people would think of because there's only so many things people are actually interested in. 
it turns out that even now, Google is still finding that 25% of the queries that people enter every month have never been seen before. The long tail of keywords, as I'll show you in the graph in a sec, seems to be virtually infinite. People are always coming up with new variations of words in which to search. Google's AdSense, the Ads by Google. Uh, this extends advertising to publishers way down the long tail of websites. It used to be the case that only very large websites would be accepted uh, by the companies such as DoubleClick, for example, who would provide the web advertising. If you were a small uh, company or a blog or somebody like that, the advertisers <coughs> couldn't touch you because it just wasn't worth their while. What Google did with AdSense was to realize that it could push those ads down to like, the individual publishers like myself. And so the long tail of, of individual websites, in terms of being ranked by traffic, you can now take the advertising further down. And so what Google has done is to aggregate all the individual websites like my own, all the ones that are actually generating money, even if it's only 10 cents, maybe a dollar a month, something like that. Because there are so many different millions of blogs that are exploiting this, Google's raking in the profits in terms of billions a month. Amazon, obviously, uh, carries an awful lot of products. The average Barnes & Noble carries 130,000 titles. More than half of Amazon's book sales come from outside its top 130,000 titles. So the long tail really does have value. iTunes shows that every track of its 2 million chart tunes has sold at least once. So it doesn't matter how niche you go, there's somebody somewhere, even if it's just that person's mother, who is willing to buy that particular piece of content that you put online. And Netflix has shown as well that 95% of its 55,000 DVDs uh, have been rented only once a quarter. So that's virtually all of its 55,000 DVDs are only ever rented four times a year, virtually all the entire catalog. Yet it still makes millions because it aggregates so many different DVDs. So this is the Excite query distribution that I was talking about in terms of search terms. Excite's an old search, uh, search engine. Uh, and these are your hits, the top 10%, as it were. Um, and obviously these are the key terms that we used a couple of years ago to actually uh, find things. 97% of the search terms that were used, going down here to the 10 millions, are only ever used once or twice, and they're either never used again. So, <clears throat> vast majority of search terms exist in the tail. I'll show you another example of that shortly. <clears throat> in fact, very shortly, mine. Um, this is my momentalism search terms. This is how people find uh, one of my, my key blogs. The top 10 search terms gives me 12% of all search traffic. Now, Google will give me 50% of my traffic as a, as a general rule. So obviously, I'm quite keen on getting Google to, to keep coming to me. Um, but the top 10 search terms give me 10% of all those search traffic. <coughs> those only tend to be search terms uh, for individual mobile phones that people are interested in finding. Uh, the long tail of search terms, and it is an extremely long tail, 88% of them, uh, I will only ever see maybe once, twice, something like that, and maybe never again. But that's 26,000 different search terms that are used to find my site over the last couple of years. 26,000, which is quite a lot. Obviously, I can never predict which search terms people would use, let alone which search terms people will come to my site. It's one of the reasons why writing a lot of content helps you in actually generating some cash. Now, Anderson defined what he calls the three forces of the tail. This is where the actual tail uh, is developed, uh, and not only how it develops, but what actually defines the shape of the tail. Firstly, in order to, to have a tail like this, you need to democratize the tools of production. In other words, you need to let all your users be able to create the products or the items you're interested in actually providing online. The more stuff that people create, this lengthens the tail. Because ultimately, you want to have a tail as long as possible. If you're iTunes, for example, you want to aggregate as many different tunes as possible. The only way you're going to do this is if there are a lot of people recording music. The only way that's going to happen is if the uh, products that are out there to record music become so cheap that anybody can do it. Which, of course, with a lot of the software that's out there now, that's what's actually happened. You then need to democratize the tools of distribution. Uh, and what this basically means is that you need to give access to those individual niches. You need to let people actually be able to, to find those particular products that are in there. And this helps to fatten the tail. So if more people are looking for one particular product, then ultimately each particular product will start to sell a bit more. Even if each product was, only, was selling once before, and now it's selling twice, <coughs> you've doubled the amount of times that one product is selling. You do that across the length of the tail, and you fatten the tail, and you've doubled the size of your overall market. And then finally, you need to connect supply and demand. You need to let people be able to find those products somehow. And this drives demand from the hits all the way down through to the tail for those individual issues where they want to go. 
So some examples, democratised production, we're talking about tools such as camcorders, uh, digital cameras, camera phones, even blogging tools, things like that, which have made it so easy and so cheap to actually create content that people are doing it in their millions. Now being able to create content is only part of the deal. What else you need is another way to let people actually see the content. And this is where you democratise the tools for distribution. This is a class of websites called the aggregators. YouTube, <coughs> Flickr, uh, MySpace, Bloglines, which just aggregates blogs, even Wikipedia, eBay. <coughs> they're all websites that aggregate thousands or millions of individual pieces of content. So, you've now got the producers, the tools of production, which enables thousands or millions of people to actually create content, and the aggregators, which provides a free and easy way to actually access that content. In other words, if I've created a load of images, because I've got a cheap digital camera or a cheap camera phone, that's only going to be of any value to anyone if other people can see it. Fortunately, there are such things as Flickr, so I can upload it freely to Flickr, and now anybody can see it. So that's one of the ways that you fasten the tail by providing an aggregator, being an aggregator, providing a way for people to actually see that content that you've produced. Of course, people can only find that content if you provide them with a good way of actually being able to search for it. So here, we're talking what's called filters. Ranking algorithms, such as those using Google, uh, the recommendation engines, such as Amazon recommends. If you buy a book, for example, you start looking for a book on Amazon, it says people who bought this book have also bought these books, or have also looked at these books. So in other words, you found the book that you're looking for, and there's every chance that that book that you're looking for, other people who've also bought that book, what they're interested in as well is pretty much what you're going to be interested in, because you're interested in the same things. So in other words, you found a niche in Amazon that other people before you were found. <coughs> and what Amazon's doing is helping you to explore the rest of that niche. So it's connecting supply and demand by driving people further down the tail and letting them find the niche that they're actually interested in. And blogs act as human filters as well, because my, my website, for example, has links to other mobile phone sites. Those mobile phone sites are good mobile phone sites, because obviously I rely on them for some of the information. And it's, it only makes sense. I don't want to just, just link out to anybody, so I'll link out to the better websites. And that tends to be what the, the better blogs themselves do. Also, the way people actually comment in the blogs. It acts as a way of actually filtering the information out there, um, so that the more people who actually like a particular um, bit of information or whatever, uh, the more people will link to it, and the more people will keep coming back to it. And you create a community around your website uh, of similar websites. <coughs> in other words, the niche that you occupy, you link out to, to other sites within that niche. More people are therefore able to find that niche in which you, you, you reside. Now, another way of actually funding uh, the web, the, the way all this thing works, uh, is contextual, contextual advertising. Um, the long tail that Chris Addison talked about uh, is one way that the large websites, the aggregators like YouTube and Flickr, are actually able to make their money. Um, contextual ads uh, is, is a way of actually exploiting that. Uh, as far as blogs are concerned, in particular, it's a great way of doing it because the contextual ads are just, well, they're basically uh, for people uh, with individual blogs because that's a great way of actually making money from it without relying on actually going out there and getting your own advertisers. Now, it actually works. Whereas before you had this CPM approach whereby it was a cost per a, a thousand and you just wanted people to come to your site as many as possible uh, and that's how you'd earn the money. With contextual advertising, you only earn the money if people click on the actual ad. So in other words, you need to make sure that the adverts that have been placed on your site are relevant to what people are looking for. That's why it's called contextual, because Google does this quite well, because ultimately it reads your site, infers what your site is about, and then delivers adverts that are very relevant uh, to what your site's actually talking about. Because it's relevant, there's every chance, for example, if my article is talking about, uh, let's say, the Nokia N95, and the adverts on my site say, oh, here's a cheap Nokia N95. There's every chance that people are going to click on that, certainly if they're looking to buy one. Certainly more of a chance than if that advert started to talk about jeans, for example, or the latest fashion in wardrobes. So, the amount of cash that you can earn, it's not so bad. Uh, mobile Mentalism, for example, uh, has been earning up to $3,000 a month. Mobile Tracker.net, which has stopped in the last year or so, uh, was earning, in its heyday, a couple of years back, $40,000 per month. And Plenty of Fish has been earning $900,000 in two months alone. And uh, there's the, and that's Canadian dollars, but there's not that much difference with dollars. Well, you beans, there's not that much difference with dollars these days. Um, but that was how much Plenty of Fish uh, was actually earning. It's actually earning more than that these days. That was turned, uh, done in 2006. 
That's just one guy working in an office with one helper. He has turned his site into a fantastic aggregator, so lots of different users are actually, it's a dating site basically, lots of different users are actually adding the profiles there. And because he's made it completely free, he's relying solely on the advertising uh, that Google has supplied in terms of contextual advertising. So it's a great way of earning money if you've got the wherewithal to actually create a site that large. Now, Google and contextual advertising changed everything <coughs> uh, because Google search engine algorithms actually work. Obviously, they don't work all the time, but they certainly work a lot better than search engines did before Google. So they work both for search and contextual advertising because its search engines actually can infer what a website is about much more accurately than such algorithms used to in the past. Google also has web-wide reach with 31 billion search queries a month, hundreds of thousands of advertisers, and of course, hundreds of thousands of publishers. So what Google is doing is standing directly as the middleman between people looking for a particular product to buy and people, like myself, offering information about that particular product. Google stands in the middle and says, right, this is a way for advertisers of all size, because ultimately, used to be the case that if you wanted to advertise online, you needed a lot of money, a big marketing budget. It was only restricted to those companies that could afford it. What Google's done with contextual advertising is reduce the cost of advertising so anybody can do it, which is massively <coughs> expanded the amount of advertisers out there. Same with the publishers, by letting individual publishers use their contextual advertising system, it's massively expanded the amount of publishers out there. So now you've got many more advertisers, all the way down the long tail, many more publishers, and Google's standing there in the middle, taking a cut of all the money that comes in. So that's why Google's been so successful. But it also helps the advertisers, because the contextual ads genuinely work, and it helps the publishers, because you can genuinely uh, make money. Google effectively has streamlined the whole process of connecting the advertisers with the, with the users by the publishers, uh, and it's basically win-win, and especially win for Google. The original Web 1.0 business model, which you can still see in certain places, um, this uh, I saw recently on Engadget, which is a big tech blog, uh, basically talks about gadgets, uh, not just mobile phones, but any kind of gadget, and was advertising leggings. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but this was a particular uh, CPM uh, approach in the sense that it was basically just a banner ad. Not contextual. Not entirely sure how many people who are interested in gadgets are also interested in buying a pair of leggings. No idea. But that's my point in the sense that your banner ads just had no relevance to the page as well. So the number of people who would be prepared to click through to them wasn't very high at all. So they did nothing at all in terms of advertising. With Web 2.0, however, these are the ads by Google that I'm talking about. If, I'm, if you can imagine this is my web page, which I'll show you in a sec, um, if you actually start to read this about Nokia N95, for example, and all of a sudden you've got little links here saying Nokia N95 really cheap, there's more chance that people will click on them because there's so much more relevance to what you're reading. It, it's natural for you to get clicking <coughs> and to actually find out what the information is there. So it's paid per click, so you don't automatically get paid until people, unless people are actually clicking on your site. Um, but there's a greater chance that people will do that because the ads are more relevant. It does mean that individual words now have value, and actual financial value. Advertisers bid on certain keywords, so different words will have different values according to the, the price of the product underneath it. Um, it also forces the websites to become niche, because in order to make a success of this, you need your website, your pro blog, to focus on one thing and one thing only. I, for example, focus just on mobile phones and I don't talk about anything else. And that's what a, a pro blog differs from a normal blog. Your average blog, the audience, is just your friends and your family, and that's all you're interested in. So you talk about your cat, your holiday, your car, what you did last week at the weekend, for example. Nothing of any interest to anyone. And if you try to monetize that using contextual ads, one minute you get ads on holidays, the next you get ads on cars, then on your cat and things like that. Ultimately, it'll be all over the place. And so people who come to your site, <coughs> they will be interested in your adverts. But by only focusing on one thing, you've defined your niche. Everybody who comes to your niche are also interested in that thing that you're talking about, and the adverts are solely targeted at that niche, so there's more of a chance of people actually clicking on them and earning a bit of cash. Which is where we come to pro-blogging. Like I say, blog, simply a web blog or a journal, expressing your thoughts or comments in reverse date order. Pro-blog, a well-researched, well-organized, professional blog, focusing tightly on a specific niche. And the niche is absolutely crucial. This is the pro-blogging process 
this ultimately is the way I go about doing this. This isn't the only way that you can do it, but this is the one that tends to work. Obviously, you need to write content. The more content you write, the longer your tail of search terms that are going to be relevant to your particular site. So writing content is a good thing. You also, though, need to make it highly high quality and focused article <coughs> on what a large readership is interested in. Writing high quality content that's different from other people's is going to get more people coming to your site because you're differentiating yourself from anybody else out there. And you'll have a lot of competitors. Monetize your site, obviously place ads throughout it, whatever you think is good. <clears throat> Information architecture, you need to identify the navigational structure of your site uh, and channel your visitors to individual posts that they want to read. For example, they might be interested in Nokia phones, but then they might be interested in Nokia camera phones. And then they might be interested in specific Nokia camera phones. So try to design the structure of your site in such a way that it's easy for them to find exactly the phone that they're looking for or whatever item. By funneling them down to one particular page, the ads on that page will be specific to the specific product they're interested in, and they're much more likely to buy then because they bother to get down to that level. So they're clearly interested in the product you're talking about. You need to optimize your size. And this is tricky because tweaking the ad positioning, where you place the ad, the size of the ad, even the <coughs> colors of the advert can make a huge difference in the amount of people who are prepared to actually click on it. The difference can be extreme. Uh, you can be talking about doubling the amount of people who click on your ads and doubling your income just by changing the color of the links. It's, obviously, that depends. You've got to do a lot of testing to find out what works and what doesn't. But optimizing the look of your ads is crucial. You then need to do what's something called search engine optimization, which is where you optimize the web page in such a way that you're actually telling the search engine these are the keywords that are specific to this particular page. You're effectively helping the search engine out um, through all sorts of little HTML uh, techniques that you can use so that the search engine is actually able to infer what that website is about, or that page anyway, uh, much more usefully than it could if, you, if your words and your HTML is all over the place. Effectively, that means you're writing for two audiences, a human audience with high quality traffic that's relevant to what they want to hear and is actually good, something for them interesting to read, and then the search engine, who you're also helping out, trying to tell the search engine what your actual content is about. You then need to do something called link building, which is where you go out to other bloggers, other people on the web, and talk about the things that they're talking about with links back to your own site. So ultimately, you're not writing in, in, in isolation, but you're getting involved in your local niche community so that more people will come and look at your site and hopefully link to you. Um, traffic building gets more people coming to your site than web metrics. Web metrics are absolutely crucial because this is how your users are interacting with your site. What are your most popular posts? Which areas of your site are, clicking on, are people clicking on? How is your traffic doing over time? Is it rising or, or is it falling? If you can identify the most popular posts, write similar posts. Because ultimately, you've got a long tail of posts where some are your absolute hits and some are out there in the tail. But if you're an individual pro blogger, there's just you. So you can't afford to like, be focusing on the tail. That will happen all by itself. You, unfortunately, have to focus on the hits. And it's web metrics that will take you there. Now, to give you some example of how much, well, of, of how I've been going on with the pro blogging thing, um, pro blogging for profit. My aim of doing the pro blog was ultimately to earn a bit of cash. Uh, I just bought a car and I thought it would be great if I could earn enough to pay off the car loan. So, the first month, I spent a lot of time researching the area that I should actually be involved in, setting the site up, uh, developing its look and theme, and I thought, boy, this is going to be great. I'm doing quite a bit of time doing it. The first month that I spent doing it, I earned 70 cents. 35 pence for a month's work, which was obviously a little bit off-putting. Carried on though, because I've read that it took a long time, and that ultimately the one thing that stops the vast majority of people from doing this, because none of it individually is particularly difficult, you just need to do a lot of things all at once. Um, but the thing that puts off most people from actually developing a pro blog and keeping it going is motivation, because they get put off very early on. And the second month, that I did this, again, after like trying various things and thinking, oh, I'm really going to do it now, I'm really going to get successful, $2.18, which obviously was a threefold increase of what I'd earned before, but I'm still earning a pound a month, not exactly covering my hosting costs. However, I persisted, because I'm like that, and in the third month, after kind of finding my way around a bit and getting more people in, I struck lucky, and I earned $84.20. And the way I struck lucky was that I wrote an article and submitted it to Engadget and Gizmodo. It was about a latest phone that was coming out that nobody else seemed to be talking about. 
and, and in Gadget and Gizmodo picked up on it, wrote about it, and provided a link back to my site. And because Gizmodo and Engadget get such a huge number of people coming to their web pages, um, those people then clicked on my site to find out more information about it. And that's what brought more people in, and they then started to click on the ads because I was getting suddenly a big spike in traffic. And so I thought, ah, oh, now I see how it works. And you start to feel your way around the way the actual web, the way traffic comes in. Basically, the value of the links. Here's an example of my earnings over time. Uh, this, uh, bear in mind, I started this, I think it was July, August 2005. Um, and as you can see, it's a nice curve that rose quite, quite nicely. Um, so by May 2006, it was up in the $500 a month range, which certainly wasn't too bad, paying off my car quite nicely. Carried on though, because I thought, well, how, how far can I take this? Uh, May 2007, we'd reached the $3,500 a month stage. Now, obviously, that was very nice indeed. I was quite happy with that. Um, and I thought, well, this, this is going really well. How much further can I take this? So I extrapolated from there. I thought, let's do a bit of proactive research. Let's have a look at see what I can earn. There's a nice curve that seems to be following there. How long will it carry on? And if you spot the trend, you get y equals 1.2164x <coughs> to the power of 2.6297, which is a great power law uh, curve, which if you carry it on, means that after 12 months, I should be in the $12,000 stage mark, which I'm not. Um, but ultimately, it was nice to think that I would be at that particular time. Um, obviously, it flattened out, which means it declined a little bit, which I can talk about later. Uh, since then, uh, various things have changed in terms of Google's AdSense. I've also actually started to diversify into other advertising schemes as well. But nonetheless, it's still quite a nice bit of extra cash to be earning. Uh, this is the Google uh, site where you actually see various things, and that's just to show uh, that, yeah, I can actually earn that, just in case you don't believe me. Now, the niche, obviously, is very important in actually earning all this. I say that you want to laser focus the content that you're talking about to one specific niche. For blogs, a niche blog is a blog that publishes information solely on one topic. With me, obviously, it's mobile phones. Uh, I think I've already said that, so I can move forward. You have to follow the rules of supply, demand, and value when it comes to identifying your niche. Obviously, there are so many different things you can talk about out there, literally anything you want to, but only some of those are going to have value. So, in order to define and to identify what niche you want to talk about, firstly, you need to look at supply. How many people are searching for a specific topic? If you focus on a topic that you're really interested in, but only 10 people in the world are, you're not going to get a lot of traffic. Um, you've then got demand. How many people are actually writing about that topic? In other words, how much competition is there? How many people out there are actually going to be your competitors? Because again, if you're writing a great article, but you're swamped by a million other people writing about the same thing, people are going to find it very difficult <coughs> to find your blog as opposed to anyone else's. And then finally, value. How much are advertisers paying for that topic? Because you might be the most successful blog in your niche in the world with a great amount of traffic coming in, but if, if advertisers are only paying one cent per click, again, you're not going to do very well. You need to think about how narrow your niche should be. Now, this is going to depend on your blogging strategy. You can blog for the long term, like I do, with sites that I try to keep going and, and keep going and keep going, uh, and provide lots of content for. Um, now, if you're going to do this, it doesn't matter if, you, if your blog <coughs> is super niche or reasonably widely niched. I talk about mobile phones. That's my niche. More, more tightly focused uh, niches, for example, would be just blogs about Nokia phones and no other manufacturer. Taking it down further still, some smaller blogs will talk about just the Nokia N95, just one mobile phone. So how far you want to go depends on your blogging strategy. I've also created a website called GloriousLasVegas.com. Uh, the niche in this case is anything to do with Las Vegas. A tight niche, obviously, will be just those hotels that are specific to one company, like Wynn, for example, or just an individual hotel. If you're blogging for AdSense, in the sense that if you actually want to create a site still with good quality content, but you don't want it to have thousands of, view, uh, of people, you just want a website that you knock up quickly with relevant content that people are actually interested in, but that's ultimately has only got maybe 10 or 20 articles on it, which doesn't take long to do, giving you a chance to go on to another site, and another site, and another site. So in the end, it's actually what you're doing. You're not creating one big site, you're creating lots of smaller ones, and then super narrow does matter. You need to create a website that's focused on one topic only. An example that I use for this is VegasHotelPools.com, which is sort of a competitor to Glorious Las Vegas, but its niche is Las Vegas Pools, 
in today's a community that is developed who are interested in the pools of the Las Vegas hotels. Not entirely sure why, but such a community does exist. The way you find your niche, you identify the topics that you want to write about, and of course these have to be things that you're interested in, because if you're not interested in them, and you're trying to create a blog for the long term, you'll get bored. You determine the level of demand, there are various tools out there that will let you see how many individual keywords, how many topics that people are actually searching for. So Overture, which is now owned by uh, Yahoo, obviously we're short of well, Microsoft, um, if you click on this link, it will show you how many people are typing individual search terms into Yahoo uh, over, a, uh, over a period of a month. So you can get an indication, a feel, for the amount uh, of demand that there's going to be for the particular content that you're writing. And determine supply, <coughs> enter your keyword into Google with quotes around it. Now if you do this, what Google will return is a list of your competitors. If you put quotes around your term, then the competitors that you're seeing, those web pages that you're seeing, are those that have been highly optimized for S uh, from a search engine optimization perspective. They're your real competitors, because if you do search engine optimization well, you're automatically going to rank higher than anybody else who's not doing search engine optimization, simply because your web page is structured better from an HTML perspective. And if you put your search term in quotes, you're only going to be competing with other people who have uh, high search engine optimized pages. You then determine the value of your keyword, and Google's Ad, uh, AdWords program provides you a nice little estimate of that. So if you type in Las Vegas into there, for example, it will show you how much advertisers are prepared to bid. Not how much you'll earn per click, but how much advertisers are prepared to offer uh, for each individual keyword. So I'll take you through a bit of an example quickly. Um, two different Vegas blogs, a fantastic one on your left, uh, yeah, your left uh, called GloriousLasVegas.com, and obviously a less good one called VegasHotelPools.com. Number of searches for Las Vegas, well obviously there's quite a lot. Sorry. In this case, uh, half a million every month. Now, this is in Yahoo's Overture. For Google, you can multiply these values by about eight, and that will give you a sense of how many people are searching in Google for them. So this gives you a nice indication of how many people are searching for those individual search terms. If you focus on just Las Vegas, though, uh, you can see there's a bit of competition there. There's 50 million different web pages all talking about Las Vegas. So quite stiff competition. <clears throat> you need is a Goldilocks approach. You don't want a niche that's too hot, as in this case, because there's way too much competition. You don't want a niche that's too cold, because no one will search for the term. You need a niche that's just right. Niche keywords that you've identified without much competition that you can actually dominate. Popular, yet little competition. This is exactly what Vegas Hotel Pools did. Uh, if you look, if you type in Vegas Hotel Pool into Overtures tool, um, then the total for the top 10 terms 3,000 people a month are searching for Las Vegas pool, or some variant uh, of Las Vegas pools, uh, in Yahoo every month. That's 3,000 a month. Multiply that by 8 by for Google, you're talking about 25,000 people or so every month searching for Las Vegas pools. Uh, competition for Vegas hotel pool, 66. So that's the perfect example of a niche website that's got hardly any competition at all, yet lots of people are searching for. All you've got to do then is work out the value of that particular keyword. Now in this case, for Las Vegas, the value is nice. You're going to get, well, like I say, people will be prepared to pay $3.43 per click. How much you as the publisher get from that, obviously nobody knows because Google will take its cut from there as well. Um, but if you type in Vegas Hotel Pool, you're still looking at up to $2.56. So if we say for a bribe, we say around about a dollar per click. So 25,000 20, people <coughs> looking for that term, only 60 other competitors that you've got, about a dollar a click, that's not so bad. That's why your niche keyword uh, and your niche site is so important. Right, anybody any questions before I carry on? I'm going to have to cut this short in a sec. Any, any questions? Right, now the link building and content creation part that I was talking about, there are different types of links. You've got post links, which are links to your blog post, an individual article that you write, <coughs> um, this is transient traffic, because ultimately you've written a bit of, bit of news, for example. Uh, latest mobile phone pictures have come out, you write about the mobile phone pictures in this case, then you move on to something else. <coughs> People will be interested in it today, but like all news, not interested in it tomorrow. Your page links are going to be more long term. How-to articles are always good, or compilation articles about things. So, how to unlock a mobile phone, I wrote this back in 2005, 
it's still one of the most popular articles today because people are always interested in that, tends not to, to actually age all that long. And then you get site links, which are links to your individual sites. So in other words, people actually link it to yours as a good place to go to. Uh, those links are always visible and give you a steady stream of traffic. You want to mix them all three. The links are quite important because Google <coughs> looks at links from other sites to your site as a way of other people conferring authority onto your site. Google's search engine algorithm thinks that the more people link to your site, the more authoritative your site will be, and so the higher up the rankings you'll go. The higher up the rankings that you are, the more traffic that you get, because generally people don't click beyond the first page of Google's results. So here's an example of traffic from a post link. This is one I got one from um, uh, Gizmodo. Uh, so this was the post that I actually wrote, and this was Gizmodo linking to it. Nice little link there. Uh, and so they link to it like that, and I do hope you like the animation there. Uh, this was done in the 23rd of March 2006, uh, and this was the effects of it. So, as you can see, the traffic, I mean it was okay, it was alright, it wasn't doing too badly, and then with just that one link, the traffic spiked there. But you can see with this, not only did the traffic spike, showing how many people actually click on the links from Gizmodo, Gizmodo is a nice source to, to get your tech uh, news uh, link from, um, but also that the traffic doesn't last that long. <clears throat> because ultimately, that picture didn't have any value, value in itself. It was a novelty. It was a news item. Look at this great phone. It's only available in Japan. You can't buy it over here. But doesn't it look funny? Yes. What's next? And that's exactly what people did. So it spiked the minute it was on Gizmodo's homepage. Next day when it wasn't, all the traffic calmed down again. Dig and other sites like that give you an even bigger surge of traffic. This, for example, was how many digs I got for one of my articles uh, a while ago. 1,200 people voted on this one article, which kept it on the front page of Dig for quite some time. And the traffic that I suddenly got, as so many people were trying to get in at the same time, knocked over my web host. I think it says more about my web host than anything. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a huge surge of traffic, and it's called the Dig effect. It literally knocked over my server. This was the dig effect, though it's so great that all the other traffic that I got here has basically been flattened out. Because the peaks and everything you can't see, because the dig traffic is so great. Um, this was the dig, dig traffic in this example. 15,000 page views, and that pretty much happened all at once. And so basically swapped the server. Now a couple of interesting things to note here. This was another dig post that I got a while back. The Gizmodo posts that were really quite successful, they're nowhere to be seen. Uh, because they've all been smoothed down because the dig post was so successful. But the number of people that started to go to my site afterwards was considerably up compared to before. And that's not because they were reading that one post. A number of people had linked to that page and they'd linked to the site because they liked what they read. Those links raised my profile in Google. It increased the number of people who were coming to my site simply because they now found out about me and all the links were linking into me. So I carried on writing high quality content and because you're writing as much for the human as you are for the search engine, once people find out about you, if you keep writing content that's similar, they're more likely to come back and more likely to link to you. And that's where the success really starts to click in. And I didn't really look back after that. That was when the, the, um, the number of people actually coming to my site really started to take off. This again is the Dig and Gizmodo effects all nicely shown. These two spikes here are from Dig, like I say, <coughs> massive. Uh, the smaller spikes here, the, the bigger ones, but that's still obviously very small compared to Dig. Um, these are the Gizmodo and the Engadget links. So those Gizmodo and Engadget for tech sites, they're pure gold. Dig is very good in getting an initial surge of traffic, but it doesn't do wonders in terms of the amount of money that you earn, because nobody clicks on your adverts because they're just interested in the story. Um, then it still provides the links in, which is ultimately what you want. Right. Ad placement is critical when you're actually talking about how to optimize your site. This is Google's heat map. This is what Google suggests where you put the adverts in there. Um, if anything red, and I can, I can vouch for this, um, anything that you place there, any kind of ad there, does a lot better than anywhere else. These also do quite well. And if you put your ads in the sidebar, hardly anybody will click on them. You'll only find this out by uh, testing. You need to place the ads in a certain position, change the colors of them over time, uh, and test, test, and test again. To test those different ad placements as they're doing, and you increase the amount of money that you're getting without writing any extra content. The best ad positions are above the fold. By that, it means when you first come to the website, without you scrolling down, whatever you see straight away, that's the best place to put ads, and within the body of the text, rather than on the sidebars. Nobody reads sidebars, and nobody will read your homepage. 
you as a web designer might think you've created this web page, you've got a home page there, you've got individual pages further down, you think that's how people come to your site. Nobody visits a home page. They will find your, web, uh, your website via Google, which will link to an individual page within your site. There they'll go on it, they might click on a few other pages that are relevant, only rarely will they go to your home page to find out what your home page is all about. So don't ever design your site thinking that everyone comes to your home page, because it doesn't work like that. <coughs> this was an old example, this is what my site looked like a while back, it doesn't look like that now. Um, but these are the adverts, right there in your face, exactly where Google said they should be, and that performed rather well. Like I say, it doesn't look like that now. <coughs> this is another example, this is a way of blending your adverts in. Uh, this is uh, camera phones. Uh, I think it's just basically a blog called camera phones, basically. It's nothing to do with me. Uh, <clears throat> but what you've got here, you've got Chitika ads here, blended quite nicely with Google ads here. And it's blended perfectly uh, because these are actual links to the site. Um, this is a link to another site. This is an advert, and this is Google ads. So if you click anywhere on here, this person who operates this site will get a bit of cash. But you know, can't really tell which is the Chitika ad, which is what this is, uh, and which is the Google ad. They're blended perfectly so that they become part of the content, which is what you want. <coughs> yes, you're selling stuff. You're, yes, your advert is out there in your face. But because you've blended it into your site, you're hopefully capturing people who are genuinely interested in that product anyway. And it's by testing the position of the adverts together that you really find out what works and what doesn't. Now, I'm about to finish in a little while. Um, don't worry, Steve, we'll get you dinner in a minute. To finish on this, uh, web metrics, as I said, are vital. Uh, you can do this uh, with Google Analytics uh, or various other services under there, which are completely free. And they'll provide as much detail as you need to find uh, in terms of the way people are using your site, which lets you test. Let's you test how people are using your site, what your most popular content is, where people are coming, on, uh, coming from, things like that. Also, your ad performance, site design, etc. Your metrics can show where your visitors come from, your most popular posts, which is also always a useful thing to find because you then write more posts like it, and what key search terms that you're ranking highly for. Gain is very good because if you know people are coming to your, search to, uh, to your site looking for one particular mobile phone, again, I use a Nokia N95 as an example, then you can place other adverts on that post that's selling that phone because you know a lot of people are coming to your site just for that one phone. So it makes sense to optimize that page to say, well, look, you can buy this phone here. You don't need to worry so much about those phones that people aren't bothered looking at <coughs> your adverts, because ultimately no one's going to buy them anyway, <coughs> so no one's looking at them. This is an old example uh, of the GeoMap overlay. This is uh, from Google Analytics, showing where people were coming from uh, to my site. These days, a lot of my traffic comes from the US. Because it's .com, <coughs> Google's not entirely sure where it is. <coughs> Um, and so as, as, as I've risen higher up in Google's authority, in, in Google's eyes, you just assume they're from the US. So I'm a lot higher in some of the US sites, uh, so the US uh, search results from Google, than I am in other countries. So I get a lot of my traffic now from the US. Uh, this is the visits by source, uh, just to show you the, the popularity of Dig and the like. Um, this is, again, is going back a while. This was 36% uh, have come from Google, 18% of my traffic at the time came from Dig. Uh, Gizmodo was represented here, um, and Yahoo was represented here. Google, for me at least, is by far the biggest search engine of all of them. It accounts for something like 95% of all visitors who come to my site from a search engine. The others are nowhere to be found. These are the most popular posts. Again, you look at the most popular posts, you, you write around that. And these are the most popular search terms. Now, this was taken, I think, last month. Now, some of these terms here I'm ranking extremely high for. Pink phones, frankly, I wrote a long time ago, and yet I still get people coming from that. Um, K850, Sony Ericsson's one of their nice uh, camera phones, so that comes up quite well. How to unlock phones, I wrote that, wrote that ages ago, and yet I'm still getting uh, lots of visits uh, a day on that. And best camera phone, which isn't a bad keyword to, type, uh, to, to actually attract. Because if people type in best camera phone, they're looking for the best camera phone. In other words, they want to know what the best one out there is so they can buy it. So they're coming to your site with the intention of buying. Now click more on your ads. So that's another good one to write for. Now, this is the traffic that's happened from September 2005 when it started to the present. So, this was where I got my dig 
uh, hits. As you can see, Dig even now still counts uh, for a lot of the traffic there. This was then I changed my theme and forgot to put Google Analytics in, so Google Analytics.